Richard Howe, richardghowe.com. You can get much of what he's saying right there off his website, H-O-W-E, last name. I'm Frank Turk. You're listening to Cross-Examined on the American Family Radio Network. Richard, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the passage, and I think it's Colossians 2, where Paul seems to diss philosophy. Can you just in a minute or two unpack why that's not what he's saying? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, we wouldn't be able to diss, we wouldn't be able to avoid philosophy if we didn't have some kind of philosophical knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, as Thomas Aquinas said, because the believer must at times oppose the philosopher, he must make use of philosophy. But right. in the context, Paul's not even talking about philosophy as a discipline like we're talking about it, metaphysics, epistemology. That, the word wasn't even used that way in his day. The context of, of that verse out of Colossians 2, verse 8, is this insidious kind of uh, legalism that was infecting the Colossian church. And, and that was the philosophy. Uh, if I could just pause that for a moment. Um, Dr. Howe and I uh, had a uh, very interesting, unscheduled discussion at Southern Evangelical Seminary um, in, what was that, 2012? I think it was about, was that one? 2012 or 2013, somewhere around there. And I don't know if, do we have that linked off of our, our thing? I don't, I don't know that we do. But anyway, it was a impromptu mini-debate with zero preparation, on my part anyways. And we obviously come at things from a very, very different perspective. Um, he is a uh, huge fan of Thomas Aquinas. And SES... Big promoter of Thomas Aquinas. I have made the connection, and I don't think anyone can really argue the connection uh, between Aquinas and uh, uh, getting the right verse up here between Aquinas and Roman Catholicism and the many converts to Roman Catholicism that have come out of SES. I, I don't think that's really questionable. But anyway, um, we had a discussion about this. You can you can listen to it. On, on YouTube, if you just put the two names in, I'm sure it'll probably come up. Uh, I'm not sure I'm not doing the search for it right now. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's what's going on in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, there is a fundamental contrast here between the fact that in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and the philosophy of the world which would include natural philosophy. Now, it depends on how you define natural philosophy, I suppose. Um, but the idea of limiting Colossians 2 to some kind of, well, there was a specific context going on there, um, is a bit troubling to me. I, I'd like to hear what the exegetical basis for that would, uh, would be. And vain deceit that he was warning them about that the, that you can be righteous by this meticulous attention to all these you know grow this out cut that off don't eat this don't eat he's like no that's not how you're righteous before God that is, he goes on to repudiate the people who say that it has a false sense of humility but it is of no use in curtailing the indulgences of the flesh so uh, it, it, it's not even talking about philosophy as we're saying here and. If a person's going to give me an argument as to why the Christian wouldn't, shouldn't use philosophy, he's being philosophical in making that argument. That's right. That's right. It's he, impossible. He can't avoid the categories of philosophy. Well, the, the problem, of course, is that what we are concerned about, and I've expressed this to Dr. Howell before, and Dr. Turk was in the room when I did this, by the way. Um, the, the problem is that what we're saying is there is a, such a thing as a love of the wisdom of Christ, but that has to be distinguished from an earthly wisdom. So there is, there is a repudiation biblically of the idea of neutral philosophy. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. And I, I, I don't believe that Dr. Howe or Dr. Turk would agree with me on that. I say there's no such thing. There can't be. Um, there cannot be such thing as neutral philosophy. Doesn't, there's no such thing as, an, as neutral ground. Uh, not if you have a consistent Christian worldview. In order to formulate and advance his argument. 
Friends, it, it, while it is true you can use bad philosophy, it's impossible to use no philosophy when interpreting the Bible. And so, but that doesn't make philosophy primary to Revelation. That's where the issue is. Uh, I think these gentlemen do believe that philosophy is more fundamental than Revelation because you have to have philosophy to interpret Revelation. I didn't, I, the, there was no philosophical classes offered to Adam before God said, thou shalt not. Doesn't work. Not from a Christian worldview. To make that very clear, you are always using philosophical principles, whether you're trying to interpret the Bible, trying to interpret the newspaper, trying to interpret a sermon, whatever you're Whatever you're trying to interpret, you're using philosophical principles. The question is, are those philosophical principles rational? Are they true? And that's what we're trying to get at right now. Uh, well, right. now you know, and what's the basis for that? From a Christian perspective, it's, it's whether they are according to Christ. Uh, not, not, not whether they can, whether you can offer a particular proof for them, but whether they are, are consistent with the revelation that is fundamentally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, when people claim that the Bible is true, uh -huh. and I, I ask them, so you believe the Bible is true? Yes. Well, uh, do you believe it's inerrant? Yes. Well, in order to believe that the Bible is inerrant, they'd have to know what an error is. Sure. But in order to know what an error is, they would have to know what truth is. But to know what truth is in that discussion is a philosophical question. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a philosophical question. It doesn't make philosophy primary to revelation, because God made us capable of doing those things. He made, he made us in the image of God. Um, and so the idea that, well, and that makes philosophy fundamental, more primary, and hence truths of revelation have to be based upon philosophical argumentation. That's what we're saying. That's backwards from the biblical revelation. That's, that's really, and that came up over and over again in, uh, in that conversation a few years ago. Even their claim, well, I only believe the Bible, is, is itself has these tacit commitments to, to categories like truth and error, which are themselves philosophical categories. Well, Richard, talk me off the heretical ledge here, because I don't want to say anything false. Do you agree when I say that, technically speaking, the foundation of Christianity is not a collection of ancient writings we call the Bible? The foundation of Christianity is the reality of God and the historicity of the biblical t events, including the resurrection of Christ. Is that Okay, now, again, this is why people are linking me to this, I'm, I'm, and, and this is the first time I've heard it. So you are watching immediate interaction. I, I did not listen to this before the program started. Some people say, well, you shouldn't do that. Well, it's a live webcast, the way it goes. Uh, that's evidently um, when Andy Stanley in the sermon the week before pointed to one book, it was Frank Turek's. So evidently that's where he's getting it from. All right. And as I said then, and as I'm now going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to save the Andy Stanley sermon for the next program because this is going to go long enough. It's already jumbo as it is. It's going to go long enough as it is. So we'll we'll do that uh, on the next next program. Andy Stanley, and it and this question this question, fundamental category errors. It's ironic that people who are so big on philosophy are not so big on not making fundamental category errors because they're fundamentally fundamental category errors here. We're talking about the foundation. Let me, I don't know how well this works. This is a, I'm not playing this. Uh, yeah, there we go. Let's see if this you believe works. The Bible is, is itself has these tacit commitments to, to categories like truth and error, which are themselves philosophical categories. Well, Richard, talk me off the heretical ledge here, because I don't want to say anything false. Do you agree when I say that, technically speaking, the foundation of Christianity is not a collection of ancient writings we call the Bible? The foundation of Christianity is the reality of God and the historicity of the biblical t events, including the resurrection of Christ. Is okay. I am offended by the description of Scripture as a bunch of ancient writings, first of all. I don't know how any Christian can even use that language. I don't know how anybody who's ever read the 119th Psalm can use that kind of language. I don't, I don't, have, I, I, I don't understand it. If you really have a... Well, I don't, know, don't even know what terminology to use for it anymore, but my understanding of Scripture, my commitment to Scripture, will allow me to 
recognize the limited truth that Scripture is a collection of ancient writings, but to say that that's all it is, and then to contrast it with what God has done in Jesus Christ, I do not even begin to understand that mindset. What I know of what God has done in Jesus Christ, I know because, and, and, and the reason I, I can know it with the authority and certainty of God is because God has spoken, and what God has spoken is theanustos, and the only thing I have that's theanustos is Scripture. So to even make the distinction, see, I, I don't know what these guys are doing. Is, is this, you know, let's, let's do the least common denominator thing here. Let's so boil it down that now we don't even have to worry about defending Scripture because somehow we have created this, this ridiculous distinction. I mean, I, I don't get it because... Andy Stanley at one point in the sermon uh, quotes his daughter as saying, are, he was talking about, she had, was listening to some of the critics, and I've, I've certainly been one of the critics. Do these folks think that the resurrection took place because the Bible forced it to happen? No! What I'm saying is, to know the resurrection requires a revelation from God that is sufficient to ground the amazing statement that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That merely, primarily reliable historical documents are not going to cut being the foundation for that. I want to know it from God. And that's why we are concerned that Scripture be called and understood to be theonustos, God breathed. So from whence comes this weird distinction between what Scripture is historically or when it was recognized and bound together under one cover, any of the rest of this stuff, and the idea that, well, the foundation is the resurrection. Okay, and I know about the resurrection. I know what the resurrection means. I know the significance of the person who was resurrected. I understand the significance of the atonement. I understand the fulfillment of, of, of prophecy that led to all of it. On the basis of what? According to the one who rose from the dead, the first thing, the first thing that he did for his disciples was not give them Thomas Aquinas. He opened their hearts and their minds to understand the scriptures. What are you guys doing? What are you thinking you're going to accomplish here? I don't get it. <clears throat> well, maybe I should have listened to this beforehand. Makes sense. I agree. I think it absolutely makes sense. As okay. long as our hearer realizes that what we're saying is that the foundation, and that we're not saying it, we've exhausted the the uh, the Christian faith by this these foundational principles. There's more, like you said, there's more to being a sanctified Christian than you can get from the bare knowledge of these you know minimal events. God created the world and Jesus rose from the dead. See, this is this minimalist approach. This is this minimalist approach gone to seed. And I go back in the archives, folks. I have been warning against the corrosive effect of the minimalist approach for many, many years. There are a lot of folks don't want to have anything to do with me because I keep saying that's not enough. It's not apostolic. It's not how the apostles did it. Oh, but I've seen it work so well. Oh, so you're a pragmatist. Okay. Hmm. All right. That seems to be what's going on here. This, this massive minimalization of everything. And now it's like, well, as long as we're, what you're not hearing us saying is that, you know, for sanctification and stuff, to, to get to become a, a real good Christian, then, then you do need what the Holy Spirit has given to us. But somehow you don't need to have the foundations 
of the very redemptive events of Jesus Christ founded upon divine revelation? Look. It seems to me that there's a massive problem here in people not thinking that the Holy Spirit of God can ground his elect people in a love for his word and an obedience to his word. There is a fundamental distrust that the Holy Spirit can continue to do what the Spirit has done down through the ages. And you know where this comes from? Theology. It comes from your theology. If you believe God has an elect people and he's accomplishing his purpose, you don't even start going down this road. You don't need to. But man, if you don't have that belief, if you've got the good Norman Geislerian anti-Calvinist redefined mindset, you don't have that apologetic comfort of recognizing that we are called to defend all of God's truth and he's going to honor and glorify his truth even in the midst of judgment and that even the rejection of that truth is a part of his purpose and plan. If you're stuck with an Arminian synergistic methodology, it's going to impact not only your apologetics, but man, eventually the, the whole foundation ends up getting washed away. And that's what we're watching here. That's what we're watching here. That's why I, I keep sitting here going, what are you guys talking about? Because I cannot understand what the motivation is. Why is Andy Stanley telling 32,000 people that the foundation of the faith is not the scriptures? Well, then what is it? It's what Jesus did. Well, how do you know about that? It's in the scriptures. What are you accomplishing? What are you giving to the people? You're saying, I want people who've given up the faith to rethink they're giving up the faith. Well, first of all, theologically, what do you mean they gave up the faith? Do you even, do you even have categories in your theology for a false profession of faith in the first place? For, for the concept of apostasy? If you went to Dallas, you probably don't. Unless you left Dallas's theology afterwards, which a lot of people thankfully do. But anyway. Special truths about that God wants us to know about himself that are only known because of special revelation in the Bible, mm. like the mm. Trinity, like the mm. Gospel, mm. like the Second Coming, and principles of sanctification and stuff. But those things are not in competition to, the, to truths that we also can know from uh, general revelation. And, it, in and fact, they work in, in concert. But you can't know the resurrection from general revelation. Right? I mean, I would agree. What Dr. Howe just said, that section, though I don't see how it relates to what he was just saying, but to what Dr. Turk was just saying, but that section, yeah. Trinity, gospel, sanctification. In other words, Christian life. You don't know from general revelation. What does that have to do with the question? Which was which had this false dichotomy between knowing the resurrection as the foundation of the Christian faith and the collection of ancient writings, which is known as God speaking uh, to the Christian people. In, in fact, and this may sound a little strange to our listeners, as much of this program probably has, if you just had the four Gospels, you would labor to pull out of those four Gospels the idea that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died in your place, and by trusting in him, you, you could have eternal life. You would have a hard time coming to that conclusion just by the four Gospels. Because the Do I have to say anything? That's why they were written. John said these were written to do the exact thing that Dr. Turk just said can't do or have a hard time. I'm sure it's still in the archives. Remember Peter? Most of you don't. Years ago, we interviewed a young man. I, I, I sort of have a feeling he's probably not alive today. I think his family probably found him. But he was born on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. A missionary came through before his birth and left a New Testament with his family. They didn't destroy it. And he read the Gospels and was converted 
by reading the Gospels because he knew that was a Jesus that he had never been introduced to by Islam. Um, those Gospels were written to accomplish the exact thing that Dr. Chark just told us they don't really do a good job at. It would be a hard thing to do. Why is this happening? I don't understand. Why this minimalization on the part of apologists? I don't understand. I don't get it. Sure to listen to this. Gospels are more or less giving history. They're not adding a lot of theological gloss. They're not adding a lot of theological application or theological implications, I should say, to the text. That's what the epistles do. In fact, in fact, John just does it in one line where he says, these things were written so that you may know that Jesus rose from the dead and that by trusting in him, you can have life in his name. That's about the only place in the Gospels you get anything really close to understanding what the Christian message is. You need the epistles and the book of Revelation to go to get a, a, a much fuller, robust idea of what Christianity is. Wow. Okay, now I see why people were linking me to it. Okay, now I, I, I now, okay, now I see why I was being linked to it. Man, theology matters. Man, theology matters. Um, I'll just tell you what I'm thinking right now. When synergism encounters a society that is under the judgment of God and is turning against the Christian faith with a vociferous um, attitude. It collapses into a minimalist form of religion that's not even recognizable as Christianity anymore. Theology matters. The foundation must be there. And when the foundation has cracks in it, when the foundation has accommodated the world, once the pressure comes, 